Hello, my name is Glenn Arnold. I'm from the Ohio State University Extension. I'm here to talk a little bit about some of the research we've been doing in the state of Ohio with the application of swine manure to emerged corn using a drag hose toolbar. We think this has a lot of potential to open new windows in the state of Ohio. An issue we've dealt with for a number of years has been phosphorus getting to Lake Erie, especially in the, west, the western Lake Erie Basin. This has caused a lot of concern amongst farmers, public officials, uh, legislators. Um, we have increasing rules that we have to deal with in Ohio as a result of this. You can see the size of the western, western Lake Erie Basin in northwest Ohio. It touches all or parts of 24 of our 88 counties in the state. And you can also see in the lower left corner, Grand Lake St. Mary's, which has had its own algae issues for even more years than Lake Erie has. We store manure in Ohio in ponds. I don't really call them lagoons because we really don't look for treatment. We look to pump these out on a regular basis. And we know dairy cows will produce somewhere, when you count rainfall, lot runoff and stuff, around 30 to 40 gallons per cow per day of liquid it has to be worked with. On our hog farms, uh, they're enclosed animals. The pits are beneath the uh, livestock. Uh, more dense um, nutrient in a, in a hog manure than what's in the dairy manure. When I survey farmers and talk to them, They've revealed to me over a number of years that approximately half of our manure is applied in western Ohio and northwest Ohio in that October to December time frame. You can see on this, this uh, slide that we've got about 49% being applied at that time of the year. And I estimate that we've got about a billion gallons of uh, swine manure and two and a half billion gallons of dairy manure that has to be handled each year. And we're trying to do half of that in the months of October, November before winter sets in. Basically our windows for manure application are dictated by growing crops. Our weed acreage, which gave us a uh, July, August window, uh, that continues to decline in the state. And fall application generally starts when si silage harvest. If we have a delay in the harvesting of crops, that ends up in a delay in the application of manure. Uh, commercial manure applicators get behind, normal farmers with manure to haul get behind, and we end up with situations where manure is applied to frozen ground. Then when you have a warm uh, spell, then you have runoff and issues like that that we have to deal with. Again, uh, we're getting more restrictions on our winter manure application, but you have to really think, can we open other windows of time to apply manure? When I compare the two manures we most commonly work with, we have swine manure in the center column, we have dairy manure on the right hand column. When I look at the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potash in the manures, I like to look at the manure available nitrogen, which is in green. And essentially, that's the ammonium portion of your livestock manure, plus about half the organic portion, and that makes what we call available nitrogen. That would be nitrogen in the, fur, in the manure available the first growing season. And you can see that swine manure is setting here with 40 available nitrogen units and dairy manure is more like 12. And those can vary quite a bit from farm to farm, but at least they're fairly consistent year to year from the same manure source. And you can see there's micronutrients further down in that chart. Uh, I see sulfur, for example. And um, again, those are there, they're in the manure, they're opportunities to use we started about 15 years ago doing manure application to wheat. We did surface application. We knifed it in using this little pecan toolbar for incorporated manure application, essentially opening a slice in the soil and putting the manure over top of the slice. And then we also compared that to uh, urea, which is our standard top dress for wheat in Northwest. If you look at this chart over three growing seasons, 2007, 2008, and 2009, Essentially, there wasn't a lot of difference. The surface applied swine manure is in gold in each of the three years. That generally was the best. The red is the incorporated swine manure where we slice the wheat open every seven and a half inches, close to about the first of April is when the manure was typically applied and the urea. 
you can see how that did each of the three years and then the gray is the uh, urea itself again surface applied it just showed me and the farmers I worked with at the time that livestock manure can be a pretty effective source of uh, uh, nitrogen for wheat and the other good thing about wheat is if you over apply then the wheat goes down so you have an ins as a result of uh, of the research we have a number of livestock producers who routinely apply swine manure to soft red winter wheat around the end of March or the first of April in Ohio as this is here and um, that produces the yield they want now some of the wheat goes to uh, grain some of this will go to wheat leach uh, lots of uh, places you can go with it but again in this instance you're replacing 100 units of purchased fertilizer with 100 units of livestock manure fertilizer that you already have in your pit. The other thing to keep in mind is that when people talk about the N, P, and K of swine finishing manure, if they say, well, that pit there holds 750,000 gallons and that's worth $20,000, that may very, very well may be true, but you need to remember that about 40% of that is in that nitrogen form. So if you're just going to put it out in the fall, you're not going to capture the value of it like you could on a growing crop. And you can kind of see how the umbilical cord or the drag hose goes across the field. Pulls really, really well across wheat fields. And you can see how flat are. This is just another example of a farmer looking for a different window to apply manure. He planted this field of wheat, had the commercial applicator come in and, and uh, put manure on top of the newly planted wheat. And you can see the curve where the uh, manure was applied, where the wheat is a little healthier, a little darker, greener. And you're, again, you're capturing that nitrogen rather than losing it. This represents small plot research we did at the Ohio Agricultural Research and Development Center in Northwest Ohio at Whiteville. This is 2012 to 2016 data. The top half of this slide, everything above the cursor, is pre-emergent manure application. I thought that if we wanted to go to a drag hose someday, we would have to do it before the corn came out of the ground. So you can see my treatments are 28% UAN. We have incorporated swine manure, and this was applied with the Dietrich units, placed at about five and a half inches below the soil and covering wheels. We have surface applied swine manure. We just left the toolbar up in the air and, and applied it that way. The incorporated dairy manure is knifed in just like the incorporated swine manure was. But again, dairy manure being lower in nitrogen, we had to also add UAN to it. And then surface applied dairy manure with knifed in UAN. Each treatment got 200 units of nitrogen. So on the swine manure that came out to about 5,000 gallons per acre. On the dairy manure, I applied the maximum permitted, which was 13,500 gallons per acre in Ohio, and then supplemented with an additional 65 units of nitrogen as UAN, uh, believing that we uh, got about 10 units for each thousand gallons of dairy manure we applied. So the bottom half are post-emergent plots that we did. Very same treatments, very same amounts, done um, probably about the V3 stage of production where the pre-emergent manure applications above were always done within about three or four days of the corn being planted. If you look all the way to the right and you look at the five-year average, and there's about three droughts in my five years of research here and one outstanding year in 2013. But again, when you come across there, um, the five-year average for the 28% nitrogen was 142.6 bushels per acre. That compares pretty similar to the post-emergent application down here at almost 145 bushels per acre. But if you look at the incorporated swine manure at 158.2, that's quite a bit better than the 28 in the pre-emergent plots. And if you come down and look at the post-emergent plots, you still see that sizable yield gap of, of between 16 and 20 bushels per acre. So the incorporated swine manure, part of it from the moisture, again, 5,000 gallons per acre, maybe some of it from the tillage effect of the chisels, but regardless of what, what we give it credit to, we saw a nice jump on that yield. 
if you go to the surface applied soy manure, where again we didn't incorporate it, you can see it's quite a bit lower than the incorporated 28% nitrogen and an awful lot lower than the incorporated soy manure was. And you see the same thing show up down here in the bottom. Surface applied soy manure was below the incorporated 28% nitrogen and quite a bit below the incorporated um, soy manure on the post emergent plots. Dairy manure has similar information. If you look at incorporated dairy manure, again, a lot more, a lot more liquid here, almost three times as much, but 158.7 compares very favorably over five years to the incorporated swine manure. You come down here to the post-emergent plots, 164.6 compares very favorably to 164.3 on the incorporated swine manure. And then surface applied dairy manure, again, quite a bit less than uh, either the 28% uh, UAN or the uh, incorporated dairy manure. And at the very bottom is a nitrogen check. If you look at the growing seasons, 2013 was an excellent growing season. We got great yields. 2012 was an absolute drought, but again, the manure did pretty well. 2016 was an overly wet growing season, extraordinarily wet. And it seems like the ammonium nitrogen that was in that swine manure and the nitrogen that was in that uh, dairy manure hung around a lot better than the 28% dead. We've also conducted a lot of plots across Ohio with a tanker and a tractor in an attempt to show farmers the potential of their livestock manure. This was be an example of that where we're going across the field, we're, we're side dressing six rows of corn with this James Way tanker and a John Deere tractor. We're using Dietrich shanks. And I like those on this tanker is simply because they're helping to take out some of the compaction that we're causing. You can see we're going about 3.2 miles an hour across the field. Application rate is to match whatever the farmer wants. If um, we need 6,000 gallons per acre of swine manure to match the nitrogen side dress the farmer typically uses, we do it. If we need 6,500 gallons or 5,500 gallons, then we adjust our speed accordingly using this type of tillage equipment. This just shows that when we're using a Dietrich sweep, uh, we're going quite a bit deeper than um, some of the shallower tillage equipment that most of the industry is moving to. And this requires more horsepower, so maybe it wouldn't work on a larger piece of equipment but it works nicely on our field plots. And again, we're kind of got an eye on trying to re reduce some of the action that we cause. This is just a picture of some of the plots that we've done in Ohio in the last five years. You can see dark counties, very heavy with plots, quite a few up in Fulton County. Uh, I live in Putnam, so we've had quite a few plots there and we're gonna do quite a few more in years ahead. Um, just trying to demonstrate to farmers, get them to stew on this, get them thinking about how they might go at uh, this application process by themselves down the road. This is just an example. In 2016, we also did beef manure plots, something I had never dealt with before. We've always done swine and a few dairy plots in the past, but this is a beef manure plot and simply um, shows that in the first one, that was a Knopf Singers are in Fulton County. Um, they had a pretty good growing season. Statistically, there wasn't any difference between the manure and the commercial fertilizer. The Sin family was in Paulding, much heavier soil, a much drier growing season. We got nipped there, but I put a lot of that towards soil compaction because again, it was the first plot of the year. The ground probably wasn't as fit as it should have been. Uh, this Refinoff plot up in Fulton County, again, pretty good growing season, statistically pretty close. And then the Hoffman plot was down in Dark County, again, uh, pretty similar statistics, um, yielded uh, uh, about what we thought. But again, it's a, um, they're always replicated plots side by side, data is collected so you feel really good about the information. We also did uh, an enhanced dairy manure plots. We did three of them. Um, the one closest to me in Putnam County, the Meyerhofer plot, it just didn't rain so we didn't have particularly good yields, but we didn't lose anything either. The Schmidtmeyer plot was in Dark County. You can see that the um, uh, were similar in yield, maybe slightly more for the commercial fertilizer. And if you go with the uh, Sen plot in Paulding County where we dealt with soil compaction, uh, we did get a little bit more on the commercial fertilizer. But what we did 
differently in this dairy plot that we had never done before, or I should say all three of these, is we added the nitrogen to the liquid dairy manure as it was being loaded. We simply did it this way. You've got the top loader from the left hand side that's the red thing that's going in we're putting manure in with that then we've got our 28 tank on the right hand side we're adding our liquid manure on that side and um, our liquid fertilizer excuse me and the way this works is um, this is approximately a 5250 gallon tanker and if i go down and back in a quarter mile field once i take off the end rows um, that's approximately 12 rows, and that's approximately 8 tenths of, a, of an acre. If I put about 5,000 gallons on the 8 tenths of an acre, that's an application rate of 6,000 gallons per acre. I counted on 10 units of nitrogen being available uh, in each 1,000 gallons of manure, so that would be 60 units from the 6,000 gallon application rate. And then if the farmer wanted 150 units total of side dress nitrogen, then we simply added 90 units of nitrogen as 28% UAN, which would p basically be 30 gallons. So 30 gallons of liquid fertilizer from the white tank on the right with about 5,000 gallons of uh, hog or dairy manure from the uh, pit on the left gets us uh, the magic number that we wanted to have. If the, if the farmer wanted more nitrogen, we simply increase the amount of 28 that we would add to that tanker. So it's a way of increasing the, the uh, nitrogen amount in manure. And this would be great if we are low on nitrogen to start with, or if you, if you had more phosphorus than you wanted, so you wanted to increase your nitrogen rate and back off on your application amount, uh, that would be a way of still getting the nitrogen you want. This is really the holy grail. This is really what we would like to, to accomplish. This is Herod Farms in Dark County, Ohio. And this is how they have gone about applying swine finishing manure to uh, corn for the last three seasons. Essentially, they plant their corn fields to accommodate the drag hose. Last year, they applied approximately 1 million gallons of manure from three finishing buildings onto three fields that were close by these facilities. And um, they, uh, Tom came to one of our meetings years ago, and I talked to, uh, I ta told him I thought a drag hose would eventually work for this uh, manure application method, and he said, I'm going to try it. So he's got a seven unit applicator. I'll get another picture of it. And you can see uh, going through a field, this happens to be a VTI unit. And he's attempting to incorporate his swine manure in a field. This happens to be a no-till field. The corn is about the V2 to V3 stage of growth. You can see the hose pulling across the corn. You can perhaps hear the snapping sound of soybean stubble being broken off. And we didn't get perfect coverage, but we're working at it. We've got some improvements we want to make each year. But the general idea is that uh, he put 10 gallons per acre of 28% as starter nitrogen for this crop. And then he side dresses with 6,500 gallons per acre to meet the nitrogen needs of the corn crop and the phosphorus and potash needs of this corn crop and next year's soybean crop. It's almost a perfect match. So he would be able to side dress this field every other year when it's in a corn soybean rotation and not grow his soil levels, but have good results with the yields. This is our ultimate goal, is to get more of this done in Ohio. Uh, this is a video of harvest time. Every year, uh, Tom allows us to uh, ride with him at harvest time, he and his son, Corey. And you can see the corn standing very, very well. Every once in a while, you'll see the ground. Weed control is excellent. And we just don't find too much wrong with what we're doing. Each year he tries to leave us three strips in the field uh, where he puts commercial fertilizer on so we have a comparison. Um, in the last three years, if you look at um, the 2016, 2015, and 2014 years, 
If you look at those, uh, he's averaged 193.3 bushel per acre with his menorah, and he's averaged uh, 180.3 acres with the 28%. Now in 2014, the very first year we did it, uh, we the field was pretty wet and the corn was just spiking and we thought we did some stand damage. We thought we knocked off about 3,000 plants per acre. Uh, in 2015, uh, we didn't have any stand damage, but we got 10 inches of rain in the first 30 days of the field. And that's where we think we lost a lot of our nitrogen, especially our commercial nitrogen. And then in 2016, a little bit of more of an ideal growing situation, or maybe a little on the dry side. Uh, but again, um, Tom was very pleased with the yields. Uh, they kept up with what he typically expects in his area. Uh, very competitive, he thought, with neighbors. And certainly gets a lot of looks when he's out there in a cornfield uh, side dressing with, uh, with liquid livestock manure. If you look at the numbers on TOMS and we talk about the balance, this slide basically just talks about if, if we looked at 200 bushel corn and 60 bushel beans, which is not too far from what I would expect in TOMS area of Ohio, corn requires point or will remove 0.37 pounds of P2O5 per bushel, which would remove 74 pounds of P2O5 uh, in a crop season. Corn also will remove 0.27 pounds of K2O, which would be 54 pounds in a 200 bushel growing season. Then when he comes back the following year with his soybeans, uh, soybeans will remove 0.8 and 1.4 respectively of P2O5 and K2O. So the 60 bushel bean crop removes 48 pounds of P2O5 and 84 pounds of K2O. For a two year removal, of 122 pounds of P2O5 and 138 pounds of K2O. Now when Tom adds his manure, he adds his nitrogen of course for the corn crop, but based on his soil test or based on his manure test, he's adding 117 pounds of P2O5 and 143 pounds of K2O. So over a two year time period, he would have a net nutrient loss of P2O5 and a slight net nutrient gain on K2O. Now again, in our soils, it takes 20 pounds of P2O5 to add or subtract uh, one part per million or one pound per acre on a soil test. In our soils, it takes about 12 or 13 pounds of K2O to add or subtract one part per million or one pound per acre on a soil test. So essentially, you're looking at a, a net zero gain and uh, if you had to have more phosphorus, you wanted to build your soil, uh, instead of a 6,500 gallon per acre rate, he could raise that up slightly. I know, you know corn will take any amount of nitrogen you allow it to have. If your phosphorus levels are already quite high and you run to run larger deficits of your phosphorus, we could simply spike the manure with 28% so that we would get the necessary nitrogen and we could back off on a P2O5 and a K2O applied. So, you know, we could still do 6,500 gallons, but if we added nitrogen, or excuse me, we could add nitrogen and we could back the, uh, the rate down to um, 5,500 gallons or 4,500 gallons. Remember, all my research plots are based on 5,000 gallons. So it's not the gallonage that uh, seems to get a lot of extra yields. It's just the fact you're placing that nitrogen where the corn crop's going to use it. So at the bottom I've got an almost perfect balance of NPNK for a corn soybean rotation. And again we've worked with wheat too and we can certainly um, make that work as well in a wheat rotation. But these are numbers that um, you know, those of us who are aware of the importance of getting our phosphorus levels in line uh, with possible future legislation or possible future uh, rules and regulations uh, this does give us hope that we can do this on a commercial level with good success. Now this next slide with the weird diagram rose, Herod's plant their corn at a 45 degree angle. And they do this because this is the way the commercial applicators make their hose work out on manure application. For those of you with experience with commercial manure applicators, they will lay the hose diagonally across the longest portion of the field and once that's all laid out, they will then uh, side dress one half of the field 
uh, going back and forth. Uh, the trips get a little shorter each time. And then when they're done with half the field, then they'll swing around and they'll do the other half. So when Herod's plant their corn like this, uh, Corey usually does his own manure application. He hooks onto his own toolbar. Uh, he can basically be unassisted in uh, side dressing this entire field, uh, just having somebody back at the pump ready to shut it off when the, when the field is done. Ideally, we would like to eventually get to the point where the rows were straight and we could side dress corn uh, in, in uh, the way it's traditionally been planted. Now, there's never been a financial incentive to do this before because if you talk to our commercial applicators, they generally always have a, an, a clear field, no growing crop, or maybe just a wheat crop or a cover crop in it. And so there's never been an incentive to apply manure um, any other way but diagonally across the field. So we've got a lot of guys stewing about this in the state of Ohio. Um, and one of the, the real big reasons is that that most commercial applicators tell me that they uh, are not busy from the time corn planting starts until the time wheat harvest comes off. So we are out early in the spring trying to apply manure. Uh, then when corn grow, when the corn and soybean ground gets fit, um, planting starts, application comes to an end. And then those applicators, other than fixing and repairing their equipment and prepping for uh, the wheat harvest season of manure application, uh, they aren't drawing any income. So they're looking at this as a chance to add perhaps uh, six or eight weeks of uh, income in a growing season if they can work with the farmers to get manure on corn in a timely fashion. There's several neat ideas out there. I've spoke to uh, some groups about this. Um, we're not big on hose humpers yet in the state of Ohio, but maybe we will be. Or maybe the, the equipment we need to be successful just hasn't yet been developed yet. Um, I would not bet against uh, the people we've got stewing on this idea. I uh, spoke to our commercial applicators a couple times over the last couple years. Uh, many of them have several ideas that they would like to try. So I've encouraged them to uh, do that in the summertime on some wheat fields, wheat stubble fields, see if they uh, can make something work before you actually get into a, a cornfield and, and start uh, taking out stand. Some comments that I would have um, on this, and, and that is that um, um, for us, we found that it works best in no-till fields or what we call stale seed beds. And our stale seed beds are basically fields that were worked up and land leveled in the fall. Um, weeds grew on them a little bit in the winter time, and then farmers will use some sort of a burned down herbicide, but just plant directly into them without any tillage in the spring. So firm seed beds work way better for the drag hose than spring work fields. They can be too loose. Uh, we're thinking on some of our new manure equipment that we're going to be playing with here next week that uh, we may skip manure application to the center row of the field in an attempt to allow the hose to ride higher in the soil um, to, to reduce um, any type of damage to the field. And then I've got down, uh, we think we can re reduce some stand if the field's too wet. Basically that hose sinks in too far and when it pulls tight, uh, we have a scouring effect where we'll shear off a, an inch of soil uh, in a row right next to where the hose sets. So again, that'll reduce some stand and we want to try to avoid that. We're still working out a few kinks, but we have a lot of confidence in what we're doing. But the field can be a lot wetter than when I'm out there with a manure tanker, that's certainly for sure. And I also put down here that it works best probably in the V2 to V3 stage of corn growth. Um, how many weeks that'll be? Well, roughly to, to reach, uh, to get through the V3 stage, uh, corn I think takes about 400 growing degree days, give or take. So a little bit depends on when it's planted. If it's April planted corn, then maybe you'll have six weeks to get that done. In my research farm or OERDC research farm, I'm usually the lower person on the totem pole for uh, getting my, my plots planted. So usually we look at about a mid-May planting period and then I usually, it's, it takes about 30 to 35 days before the corn gets to the V4 stage. So my window for some of my work is a little bit smaller than maybe a traditional farmer might have. So just something to be aware of as we talk about that. Some of our applicators 
are starting to get a lot braver with their manure application to growing crops. This isn't something I necessarily promote, but this farmer wanted to try manure application to corn. So he's applying swine finishing manure at a rate of 7,000 gallons per acre to corn that's in about the V2 to V3 stage of growth. Now he's not yet willing to plant the corn to accommodate the drag hose, so he just drives across the corn instead. And he picked a pretty bad field. You can see a few skips here. He replanted those uh, and then got a little bit of rain on it and then came back with the manure application. Now if he's if he does back off on his nitrogen side dress rate, then he's probably gained something. But if he still goes in here with a very with a complete full package of nitrogen on his corn, then he's more or less just disposing of his manure on his corn. Then he has, is actually trying to uh, save some bucks on that. Now here's another example of a commercial applicator going across a newly planted field of corn. I should say it's just spiking. Whoops. Need to back up again. Now this was a spring work field, very soft and mellow, and the uh, hillside or the knob that he's coming off of is extremely soft. And uh, they didn't have any rain on the field after planting. The corn is just beginning to spike. So this gentleman is putting uh, manure on. He's applying at an angle across straight planted rows. They did that the first year and they were really happy with the results, but they weren't happy to re with the results this year. And I think this second video will show why. Because the uh, ground is so soft and the um, manure is kind of pooled, you see how we're scouring and we're either burying some corn deeper than it needs to be, but also we're we're pulling the uh, liquid off of some of the places it was applied. So essentially, the reason he was disappointed is he did not get the yields he was expecting because uh, after the manure was applied to the soil, it was then removed and kind of uh, gathered in almost like a windrow. I'll show you a picture. This is an example on the left side. You can see the manure stayed where it was applied. On the right side, you can see where the soil is a lot lighter. The manure was uh, um, gathered off with the drag hose pulling. And I looked a little closer at some of our stands. Uh, you can see some gaps where we either buried the corn deeper with the ex extra dirt or we dug the corn out during the application process. But when you got lower in the field where the no dragging occurred, um, you know, stands were just perfect. So again, it's an example. This farmer probably, if he had to do over again, would be better if he waited until the corn was this tall uh, to do his application instead of uh, hitting it so early. I think it would hold better on the, the hills and the knobs maybe than what uh, the results that he got this time. But he loves the idea. He continues to pursue it. Uh, eventually, I'll get him converted over to incorporating the manure. I feel real comfortable with that. Here's another video. And this is someone who's uh, doing some side dressing, but the field's wet. And I just want to show some of the other problems you'll have if you don't have enough tractor when you go to do this. You can see where he's driving through the manure that was applied on the last trip. You can see the front end is sliding as he goes around. Again, for 95% of the manure, he's going to be getting it in the field. He's going to get it incorporated. But the challenge you run into is uh, turning on the feet on the ends if you don't have enough tractor, especially weight in the front of the tractor. And again, the field was pretty wet. He's not able to sink his um, applicator in quite as deep as he wants to go. But it's still working pretty well for him. This was uh, Harrods in the year that we got to 204 bushels per acre. So just uh, it's a learning experience. Uh, some farmers are going to uh, experience that this year, I'm sure, in Ohio with some of our equipment. The other question often asked is how tall can a corn be when we do the drag hose work? So what we've done is we've set up uh, small plot 
research farm that we do uh, drag hose work. This is Matt Davis at uh, Northwest Branch of the Ohio Agricultural Research and Development Center. And uh, he flattened this corn. It looks like it's about V1 to V2. And you can see a broken off um, stalk right there. So it shows some damage. Again, that hose is filled with uh, liquid. It's uh, designed to, uh, and we go across the corn twice. And here's a short video. Uh, it looks like this corn's about the V4 stage. And uh, we, he'll go across it and then he'll turn around and go right back across the same row. We try to flatten all of our corn twice. We try to do it in the morning when the corn is the most brittle to try to get the maximum amount of damage. Again, we're trying to find out at what stage the um, corn is too tall for us to risk dragging a, a, a hose across it. And here's another picture he's gone back across. Um, and I know from experience, I do this, so this is my, we've got three years of data, we're going to try to get five. Anytime we snap them off and the corn starts to windrow, like here's a pile of corn that's basically several got together there and, and snapped them off. When they're snapped off, uh, the corn's going to be too tall. And um, when it doesn't snap off, uh, we are really not going to have much of a yield loss at all. And the corn, if you'll notice to the left and the right of this, looks pretty reasonable. And it was all drag hosed at an earlier stage of growth. So if you look at our three years of data, um, you've got the years across the top of this chart. And on the left-hand side, we've got um, the stage of corn growth. And then there's no drag hose as the top line and dragging twice at the V1 stage twice at the V2 stage, twice at the V3, the V4, and the V5 stages of growth. And you follow across here, I have 2014's population and 2014's yield, same way with 2015 and 2016. If you look at the three-year average down the right-hand side, um, with no drag hose, 152.5 bushels have been our three-year average. Drag hosing twice at the V1 stage, or I should say both ways at the V1 stage is 155. Uh, V2, almost 155. V3, uh, almost 157. And then V4 is where we break on this chart. Now, that's only one year in 2015 did we really get a problem. Because if you look in 2014, at the V4 stage, we're still about 150, which is better than a 145 that we did with no drag hose. And if you look in 2016, 152 at the V4 stage versus 145 with no drag hose. So only in the 2015 year did we really drop that yield. And um, again, a very wet growing season. I asked our agronomists, they think there's two major possible reasons. One, the corn could have been physically taller at the V4 stage than uh, past years. And maybe that's why it didn't uh, take it as well. The second possibility, uh, the weather was so bad, we couldn't get back in the following week to do the V5 treatments. And maybe it's just because it was overcast and wet the entire stretch of time is why we could not get to it or why the corn didn't respond well to the damage. But Make a long story short, when we look at a leaf or a stalk of corn, this rounded leaf with a collar is V1. This leaf here has a collar, that's V2. And this leaf has a collar, and that's V3. This is a V3 corn plant. This is the height of the corn that Herod's uh, uh, did their drag hose work in last year. And we feel comfortable that that's good enough to, uh, to get what we want done. There are other companies that are working uh, toward um, this type of work. And again, this is just a frack tank. The only reason I point that out, I believe we will have to haul manure greater distances. In Ohio, frack tanks are growing in popularity. There are two semis emptying into this frack tank. We buy these from Pennsylvania, where they had their oil boom. We can buy these for anywhere from five to $8,000 for the tank. And then a couple uh, weeks of uh, making some changes in a farmer's shop and they've got a pretty good uh, manure tank there or tank. And then from this frack tank, they'll have a drag hose. This is just a 
one of the newer technologies that have been developed for side dressing corn that I have a lot of confidence in that'll someday be the Cadillac that many farmers will look at using. This is just a, a, um, a Cadman system. It's a half mile of hard hose fed by a soft hose coming out of a frack tank. When they go down the field, they are applying manure. In this instance, I think the rate is 8,000 gallons per acre using an airway. And this would allow somebody to apply manure to corn much taller than what we can do with the drag hose. So that's one of the reasons I have a lot of, of confidence that this will catch on over time. And all, basically what they did is they lengthened the stinger on this or the, on the, or the arm where the manure hose is attached to. And this is, uh, you know, they were working out some kinks when I was working with them this day. It was a November day, so there's no corn in the field. But you could see this maybe side dressing corn as tall as a table in many instances. So when they get to the far end of the field, they make their turn and then they come back. And they can leave that hard hose in the same row it went down. And the Cadman is slaved to the tractor so that it will withdraw the hose at whatever speed the tractor's going. So if uh, manure rate volume drops and the tractor wants to slow down a half mile an hour, the hose withdrawal will slow down. If it uh, manure flow is running really good and they want to speed up or put a little lower rate on with variable speed, the hose will uh, speed up what's withdrawal. And um, they call this a continuous manure applicator. I think it has a lot of potential in the years ahead. And it's based loosely off some of our research here in Ohio. When it does get to the end of the field, and this is why they call it a continuous manure applicator, if everything was working perfectly, the tractor makes the turn, the hose repositions itself automatically for the next 12 rows in this sample, and uh, they're ready to go again. Again, they were working out a few kinks. They were having a little trouble that day. Uh, it didn't work perfectly, but I understand the concept. I have a lot of confidence that they'll get this all working. And they now have this hooked to a 16 row applicator, and their thought is that they could easily do uh, 100 acres in a day without any problem. Now in the state of Ohio, what we've done is we've um, gotten some donations and this is a bazooka toolbar that was specifically built for us to side dress corn in the state. Uh, it sets about three miles from my house uh, at a John Deere place. Uh, this is a couple of bazooka guys who showed up and home and equipment showed up to help put this together. And uh, we intend to go out next week and side dress corn in the state. We've got several farmers that planted fields at angles to accommodate this. They've seen our talks. They've looked at fields that we've worked in before. Uh, there's another picture of it. They're set at 30 inch units. Um, so it can go down through the cornfield. Uh, this basically is simply a uh, wavy coulder, uh, followed by a boot putting the manure over that tilled area and a covering wheel on a bazooka design. So uh, it's gonna take a lot of tractor to make this work, but I think the farmers know what they're getting into. By the same token, we have a second unit also that we got donations for. This has got the Dietrich new uh, units on it. Uh, both the bazooka and the Dietrich units will swivel. So if a farmer has trouble picking this up on the end rows, uh, they could turn without picking the unit up. Um, again, this one was built by Bombauer here in Ohio. And uh, it's also set at 30 inches rows. We're uh, looking forward. And both toolbars have the ability to drop this middle unit out and run one and a half times the manure to both sides if we think that will reduce uh, the hose settling in the field as we do our drag hose work. On firm fields, I don't really think that's an issue, but it's nice to have that flexibility. And we are not going to run one and a half percent to the outside row. Uh, I think our farmers are basically just going to use their auto steer to put a unit in every single row as they go across the field. That's what Herod's have done and been pretty successful. Uh, we may get a couple more toolbars in the years ahead, but we really do need to get a season on our belt with these toolbars to have confidence that we really know what we're doing. And it works just the way we expect it will. That's just another picture of the uh, Dietrich units. Again, they have two closing wheels to go with their fluty colder in the front and the, and the application unit. So we're feeling pretty good about that. To try to move these toolbars, because we have to ha travel from field to field, we've looked at a couple um, Donahue trailers that will be able to pull these apart, set the toolbar on, slide them back together and transport. 
Uh, sounds good in theory. I'll know a lot more in another week how these work. But again, we think we're going to be moving these toolbars perhaps you know, 20, 30, 50 miles between fields. So we, we think we've got to have something that we can do it with. It takes a good tractor to keep the front end down when you have these three-point hitch tools. And um, would we someday want to go to a pull type? Uh, we're not sure, but we, you know, that's something that we'll make some decisions on down the road. This is one and last tool I just thought I would mention. Uh, this was developed by a dairy farmer in um, uh, Pennsylvania named Doug Young, or New York, excuse me. And this is a method of applying liquid manure or silage leachate or lot runoff water on any size corn. So this, um, this was designed, it puts a hose in every other row and uh, this will cover about 48 rows at a time and it's pulled also by a cadman across the field. This happens to be corn. Uh, this field was um, cereal rye. They harvested the rye for rye leach. They planted the corn and now they're, they're practicing with the manure application toolbar. And it gives us an opportunity to apply liquid manure to any size corn. And it's, we've run this through corn that's been quite a bit taller. Uh, even even near tassel time, we've run it through and it's done very, very nicely for us. Um, we've tried to put some of our videos on YouTube. So there's a YouTube site at this address you can go to. And also, uh, I usually try to put some of my successes on my Facebook account and some things that don't work so well uh, on um, this Ohio State Facebook page if you ever want to have a look, see at it and see what we've been up to. A good way to follow us. Uh, our goal, um, as we just uh, emphasized, we want to capture manure nutrients better by extending the number of days that we can apply manure in our state. We're expecting to add 100 hog buildings to the state this year. Um, we, we need more days to apply manure. We need more manure applicators. Um, so we think the application of growing crop will extend that window. I'd just like to express my thanks for all that have contributed to our drag, drag hose toolbar efforts, our research efforts in the state over the last several years and probably will be in the years ahead. It takes a lot to make these things work out as well as we hope to. With that, uh, that concludes the presentation. I'm sure we can answer questions, Leslie, if they have some.